Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon. We are starting our lecture series on the physiology of the renal system. Uh, in this part, we were going to be talking about kidney anatomy and how functionally the anatomy contributes to the formation of urine. So just a little review of the components of the urinary system. There are two kidneys, right and left. The right kidney being a little bit lower than the left kidney because we have the right lobe of the liver kind of pushing down on the right kidney. There are then two ureters where urine is transported um, once it's formed in the kidney. Uh, the urine will go down the ureters into the urinary bladder and urine will uh, be transported outside of the body by the urethra. So the kidney is your friend. If we didn't have kidneys, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. We talked about how the kidney is responsible for a lot of things uh, that helps us with our homeostasis, specifically acid-base balance. Uh, the kidney is one of two systems or one of two organs that helps us with pH balance. The other, of course, being the lungs, which we'll talk about in uh, pulmonary physiology. So if we didn't have a kidney, we have or we didn't, if we didn't have any kidneys, the only way we could probably survive is through these options, one of them not being able to survive. So dialysis, in which we have a machine kind of filtering the blood for us, um, if we didn't have a kidney uh, or we needed a kidney, we'd have to undergo a transplant, and getting a kidney transplant is next to near um, impossible because there is a long waiting list for kidneys unless you, you know, go to some CD country and buy one off the black market. Um, another outcome would be death. Again, kidneys are very responsible for maintaining homeostasis within our body. If we didn't have our kidneys, it would not be compatible with life. However, one kidney seems to be okay. About one in a thousand people are born with only one kidney. Uh, we have what's called a tremendous renal reserve. So that means that essentially each kidney works about at half capacity. If we have two kidneys, they work about half capacity. However, our renal reserve is high, meaning they do have the capacity to increase their workload. Um, you can function with one kidney. Say if you wanted to donate your kidney to science or to the black market because, you know, you need to... Um, buy a car or something, which I don't recommend. Please do not donate your kidney unless it's, you know, for some other altruistic purpose. But anyways, you can function with one kidney. However, you don't have the luxury of having a spare one in case that one kidney zonks out. So try to keep your kidneys if you can. So going into the functional uh, characteristics of the kidney and the functional anatomy of the kidney. The nephron is the functional structural unit of the kidney. There are about one million nephrons per kidney. Um, and this kind of helps us with our renal reserve. Again, each kidney only working at half capacity, but does have the ability to work more. So our nephrons, they are the structures that are responsible for form forming urine. Um, urine is formed when uh, blood that goes into the kidney is filtered um, into the nephron, so we have filtration. Um, when it goes through the nephron, we have different structures that help uh, reabsorb stuff or pull some stuff back that our body we needs. And then it also um, aids in secretion or getting rid of stuff the body doesn't need. So the nephron is responsible for three major functions of the kidney, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And we'll get into those in just a little bit. So here are some kidney functions. Um, we're only going to go over six main kidney functions. Uh, the first, of course, being the regulation of the extracellular fluid volume. Uh, we are able to adjust blood volume um, based on um, certain sensors that we have in our uh, in our um, capillaries going into and out of the kidneys. Um, and this, of course, uh, adjusting the vol blood volume helps us with the overall regulation of the mean arterial pressure or our blood pressure. Another function of the kidneys is to uh, regulate the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. When we went over 
um, osmolarity way back, we know that the osmolarity is at 280 milliosmoles. Also, another important function is the maintenance of ion balance. Um, specifically, um, we have it does maintain many ions, but in uh, the fourth function, the main ion that we are concerned about is the hydrogen ion. So hydrogen ion helps us uh, regulate the pH of the body and pH of the blood. Another major function is the excretion of waste, specifically nitrogenous waste. Um, uh, not only not, so most of our urine is made up of nitrogenous waste, as well as um, we want to also get rid of foreign products. Uh, a big fancy word for foreign products is xenobiotics. And then finally, the sixth function that you guys need to concern yourselves with is hormone production. We know that the hormone erythropoietin is um, formed in the kidney, and this uh, hormone is essential for red blood cell production. It's also um, important for the uh, production of renin, and we'll talk about renin and how that um, aids with uh, regulation of blood pressure. Um, not listed on here, but um, also important is the production of the active form of vitamin D. So just a quick recap of the blood flow going through the kidney. Uh, we know that the kidney gets its blood supply from the renal arteries. The renal arteries, of course, being direct branches of the abdominal aorta. Uh, the renal artery will then enter the kidney at the renal hilum. Again, that structure where vessels enter and exit the kidney or any organ for that matter. So renal artery will enter the renal hilum and then it will then uh, break down into smaller arteries. The renal arteries will um, feed into the segmental arteries, then the interlobar arteries. Uh, the arcuate arteries, uh, we'll see the arcuate arteries, actually the arcuate blood vessels, and how it kind of uh, divides the different layers of the kidney from the cortex and the medulla. We'll see that in a little bit. But um, from the arcuate arteries, uh, blood will then uh, flow into the cortical radiate arteries. And then from the cortical radiate arteries, we then have the afferent arterioles. Uh, the afferent arterioles are um, then going to feed into the first part of the nephron, which is the glomerulus. So a glomerulus being that tuft of capillaries uh, that actually gets filtered out within the nephron um, and will eventually um, form urine. Um, and then after the glomerulus, about 20% of the plasma that enters the glomerulus is what is going to be filtered. 80% will then uh, travel to the efferent arterioles, so leaving the glomerulus, um, and then to the paratubular capillaries. Now, we talked about portal systems uh, previously in the cardiovascular section. Portal systems are when we have uh, two capillary systems or a network of two capillary systems kind of back to back. And the kidney has its uh, a bit of a portal system. So we have the first portal capillary, which is the glomerulus. Uh, and then uh, after the glomerulus, there's an efferent arterial. The efferent arterial will then travel and form the peritubular capillaries. So we can see the peritubular capillaries that surround the renal tubules that are, um, and this is important because these structures, you know, help with the reabsorption and secretion um, function of the nephron to form urine. Basically reabsorbing the things that we need and, and secreting the things that we don't. Uh, and the efferent arterial is a very special structure because it's the only arterial to be between two capillaries. So it's between the, the glomerular capillaries or the glomerulus and the peritubular capillaries. So we have this unique arrangement of arterial, then capillary, then arterial, then capillary. And again, arrange, this arrangement being unique to the kidneys. So the nephrons being the structural functional unit of the 
uh, kidney, we have different types of nephrons. We have cortical nephrons and we have juxtamedullary nephrons. So we can divide the kidney into an outer layer, which is the cortex and an inner medulla. And we have the uh, arcuate vessels, the arcuate blood vessels to help us kind of make that division between the cortex and the kidney and the medulla. So nephrons, they start off in the cortex and basically based on their location in the cortex plus their um, uh, the size of the nephron, they can be divided into either cortical nephrons or juxtamedullary nephrons, depending on where they're located. The nephrons located more on the outer part of the cortex these are the cortical nephrons. They make up about 80 to 85 percent of all nephrons and are located high um, in the outer portions of the cortex. And um, they definitely differ from the juxtamedullary nephrons because they have shorter uh, nephron loops or shorter loops of Henle. Whereas the juxtamedullary nephrons, we can see uh, they are around or near that border at the junction of the cortex and the medulla. So we have again those blood vessels, the cort cortical, I'm sorry, the arcuate vessels that separate the cortex from the medulla. And we can see these, um, the nephrons starting or near the uh, border between the cortex and the medulla. And again, these are called juxtamedullary nephrons. So juxtamedullary nephrons make up about 15 to 20 percent of all nephrons. Uh, they can be differentiated from the cortical nephrons because they have longer loops of Henle and uh, they are actually responsible for um, forming the bulk of all urine uh, within the kidney because the longer the loops, the more ability they have to form urine. So it's within this loop of Henny that we'll learn that um, urine will be either concentrated or diluted. So getting into the structure of the nephron. So the nephron has two functional units. Uh, going back to anatomy, there's the renal corpuscle, uh, which is this part and is made up of two subparts. And then we have the renal tubule. Um, which is uh, the tubular part of the nephron. So the renal corpuscle has two main parts. It has the glomerulus, which we talked about being that tuft of capillaries uh, where plasma will eventually be filtered. Um, and then we have the glomerular capsule or the Bowman's capsule. So this is uh, a structure that surrounds the glomerulus um, and where the plasma will be filtered across and into. And we know that the glomerular capsule or the Bowman's capsule is continuous with the next part of the nephron, which is the renal tubule, uh, specifically the proximal convoluted tubule. So the function of the renal corpuscle is to form ultra filtrate through filtration. Um, filtration, again, being that first function of the nephron. When we talk about ultra filtrate, uh, we are talking about um, a fluid that is protein and cell free. So we have certain elements of the Bowman's capsule, uh, specifically the inner layer that helps to filter out proteins as well as the formed elements of the cells. So renal corpuscle main function is to filtrate or um, form ultrafiltrate through filtration. The next part of the nephron is the renal tubule. And there are different parts of the renal tubule. So first we have the proximal convoluted tubule here. Um, and the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, once it goes down into the medulla, it is continuous with this next portion, which is the nephron loop or the loop of Henle. And we can see that the loop of Henle has two uh, de specific parts to it. We have the descending limb going down into the medulla and then it'll go back up and loop around uh, and this forms the ascending limb. And then once it hits the cortex, it then becomes the distal convoluted tubule. So this uh, part of the renal tubule, which is the distal convoluted tubule. And at this point, um, we have final formation of urine and then all distal convoluted tubules will then uh, drain or um, transport urine into the collecting ducts, 
Okay. So, uh, parts of the renal tubule, we have the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle with the descending limb, ascending limb, and then the distal convoluted tubule. The function of the renal tubule is to adjust the ultrafiltrate uh, via reabsorption and secretion. So this is a very important function because um, what we filter, only 1% forms urine, okay? So um, we filter about 125 milliliters um, per minute of plasma. That's about 180 liters of water per day. Imagine peeing 180 liters of water per day. That would be a lot. We don't do that. Most of that gets reabsorbed. So only 1% forms urine. We reabsorb the things we need, uh, such as glucose, uh, important ions, and we secrete the things we don't, like nitrogenous waste products. So the major function of the nephron, as we see through the different... Um, functional units or functional parts is to form urine through filtration, uh, reabsorption, and secretion. So as stated before, the renal corpuscle consists of two parts, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. Now breaking down the word glomerulus, it basically means ball of yarn. Uh, it looks like a ball of yarn if you look at it histologically uh, under a microscope. So the glomerular capillaries uh, filter. About 20% of the plasma that is filtered becomes ultrafiltrate. Um, we remove proteins as well as formed elements. And we have uh, various um, layers within the Bowman's capsule to help us uh, prevent protein from entering urine. I mean, it does happen in some pathological conditions or non-pathological conditions, but for the most part, normally we do not have protein in our urine uh, because of the renal corpuscle. Um, so 20% um, that enters um, is filtered and 80% will go out to the efferent uh, arterial. Um, the plasma in the glomerulus, so this is the fluid that becomes ultrafiltrate. Again, no proteins, no cells. The Bowman's capsule, also known as the glomerula capsule, has two layers. Um, think of, you know, when you put your hands together, you have a, your fist. Um, one hand is your fist, and the other hand, um, you can kind of encircle your fist. And the hand that is encircling that fist, that could be the uh, Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. And then you have two different layers. You have an outer parietal layer um, and an inner visceral layer, much like in anatomy when we talk about the, the different layers within uh, the pericardial activity or uh, cavity or the, you know, the pleura, we have an outer parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. So the Bowman's capsule has an outer parietal layer. Uh, it does direct ultrafiltrate flow, but does not have any role in filtration. Uh, the layer that does have um, a role in filtration is the visceral layer. When I think of viscera, again, I think organs. So this is the inner layer that adheres closely to um, not an organ, but specifically the uh, capillaries of the glomerulus. So the visceral layer, layer is important because it actually um, allows this portion of the Bowman's capsule to be a selective filter. So aids in selective filtering, meaning it prevents proteins and formed elements from going into the renal tubules. So here we can actually see a high magnification view of the glomerulus. So as we can see, it looks like a ball of yarn. And then around it are the various tubules. We don't know specifically which tubule this is, but uh, you can see a cut edge of uh, part of the nephron tubule. Um, more than likely, either the proximal convoluted tubule or the distal convoluted tubule. So here we see the renal corpuscle up close. Again, we have this afferent arterial, um, about 20% of the plasma is filtered and then the other 80% will leave uh, via the efferent arterial. 
And then we have this um, Bowman's capsule surrounding the glomerulus. We have that outer parietal layer, which is made up of the simple uh, squamous epithelium. And, um, and then we have the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. Uh, we can see that the visceral layer is actually composed of these specialized cells called podocytes. Um, podo means foot. And then the, the pedicels, uh, you can see, kind of interdigitate with one another that forms little slits that are actually important for filtration. And we'll see an up close picture of that in the next slide. Um, but as we can see, the parietal layer of the Bowman's capsule is continuous with the first part of the renal tubule, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. And then we have a space between the visceral and parietal layer. Uh, that is the, uh, the Bowman's space or the capsular space. So here we see the filtration membrane that is formed um, between the uh, epithelium of the capillaries and the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. So there are three components of this filtration membrane. Uh, we have the fenestrated epithelium of the capillaries. So fenestrated just means there's windows or, or, or holes or spaces. Um, through these fenestrations or the pores in the endothelium of the capillaries, this is where plasma will leave the capillary. Again, only 20% of the plasma in the glomerulus will uh, become filtered. So we can see... Um, eventually that the plasma will leave the capillary through the fenestrations. Um, it will go through the second part of the filtration membrane, um, which are the filtration slits between the foot process of the podocytes. Um, and this is covered or kind of um, held together by this basement membrane. Okay. This basement membrane is basically a fused basal lamina of the endothelium of the capillaries and the podocyte epithelium. Okay, so these uh, structures are important in forming that filtration membrane to help filter out uh, proteins and formed elements. So these are the three layers of the filtration membrane. We have the glomerular fenestrations. Again, these are the capillary pores uh, within the um, endothelium of the capillaries. Um, helps to filter out any cells, any formed elements. Then we have the slit membrane. Uh, the slits are between the pedicel of the podocytes um, of the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. So the slit membrane holds capillary cells and podocytes together via basal lamina. Um, it is negatively charged. It's a negatively charged area, meaning it will hold on to charged particles and keep the proteins that are positively charged um, from moving across into uh, the Bowman's capsule. Okay, so um, it's very important from preventing uh, proteins from entering the filtrate. Um, so again, the slit membrane is a negative charge. Um, um, it's a very coarse sieve. A sieve is something that kind of filters stuff out. And then you have the filtration slits. So the filtration slits are within the visceral layer, layer and these are the slits between the pedicels um, of the podocytes. So we have this um, basement membrane here, again, that is a negatively charged area, uh, which filters proteins and prevents proteins from entering the ultrafiltrate. Um, and then we have these filtration slits between the pedicels of the podocytes, okay, that allow for uh, the ultrafiltrate to enter the, uh, the renal tubule. Now, the glomerular capillary is actually 100 to 1,000 times more permeable than others. It's more permeable, but because of these structures, um, these structures uh, are more selective due to these fused membranes. So uh, we don't want to 
filter everything out. We, you know, we want to hold on to uh, important uh, important stuff that our body needs. So yes, it's more permeable, but it is more highly selective of what gets filtered. Moving on to the next part of the nephron, the renal tubules. So the renal tubules, um, the main function is basically to modify the ultrafiltrate by reabsorption and secretion. And we have two twisted tubes um, that are connected by a hairpin loop. Okay, so we have the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule basically named by, you know, the convolutions of the tubes. And then we have this uh, long half paperclip type structure. Uh, this is the loop of Henle or the nephron loop. Okay, so the first part, we have the proximal convoluted tubule, which is uh, directly connected to the Bowman's capsule, which picks up the filtrate uh, and becomes ultrafiltrate. So ultrafiltrate then travels through the proximal convolute tubule. It will then go into the medulla. Um, and then once it goes down into the medulla, we have that first part, the descending limb of the loop of Henle um, or the nephron loop. And then we have a turn right here, which then the loop will go up towards the cortex, becoming the ascending limb. Um, and then once it gets back to the cortex, we then have the distal convoluted tubule, which will drain urine into the collecting ducts. So first we're going to talk about the proximal convoluted tubule. The primary function of the proximal convoluted tubule is reabsorption from the ultrafiltrate to return stuff back to the body. Um, Basically, the majority of reabsorption occurs here. We don't want to lose, you know, these important, um, these important things such as ions, glucose, uh, amino acids. Uh, if we move solute, then of course water will follow. So we have a large reabsorption of water as well. Now this occurs either through passive or active transport, and because we have active transport uh, in this area, the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule will have many mitochondria uh, to provide the ATP needed for active transport of materials. Okay, so, um, and we also have lots of microvilli uh, within the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, primary function is reabsorption of the ultrafiltrate to return important uh, things back to the body. Now important to note here um, in the proximal convoluted tubule, we have the uh, major uh, amount of glucose being reabsorbed back because we do need our sugar. Um, anything that is, any glucose that is not reabsorbed in this part of the renal tubule will end up spilling out into the urine. So we talked about uh, p uh, patients with diabetics. Um, once glucose reaches the proximal convoluted tubule, we have glucose transporters that reabsorb glucose here. Um, if we reach the renal threshold for glucose, meaning once we hit the transport max in which the transporters are 100% saturated, glucose will appear in the urine. So um, this is known as glycosuria. Okay, so glycosuria, uh, glucose appearing in the urine, uh, indicative of patients with diabetes because they have a high blood glucose levels. So we know that renal transport can reach saturation. Again, this is called transport max. Um, we see here uh, that the um, plasma glucose uh, rate, usually for max, is about 200 to 300 milligra uh, milligrams per 100 milliliters of plasma. So once we reach that renal threshold of about 300, we can see that um, glucose becomes excreted out into urine, okay? 
So any glucose that is not reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules will be uh, part of, will appear in urine. Now the loop of Henle is um, an important structure because it concentrates and dilutes ultrafiltrate. So we have the movement of water as well as solutes. But what's important to note is that water here can move independent of uh, the solutes that are either um, absorbed or secreted. So usually water um, moves via obligatory flow, meaning you know if solutes move, then water moves with it. But here we just have a movement of water independent from solutes. So the function of the loop of Henle or the nephron loop is to dilute or concentrate ultrafiltrate. So the different parts of the loop of Henle are either permeable to water, um, allowing a urine to be concentrated, or uh, so the descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water only, uh, meaning water can move uh, within this part of the nephron loop. The next part of the, of the nephron loop, the ascending limb, is only permeable to solutes, not water. So first part is permeable to water, not solutes. The second part is permeable to solutes, not water. Um, and again, these are independent of one another. So the longer the loop of Henle, the more you can actually concentrate urine. So juxtamodulary nephrons have longer loops of Henle, Henle uh, and, they, and they are, you know, basically make up uh, the bulk of the workload in forming and concentrating or diluting and concentrating urine. So in the descending limb, which is permeable to water, we can take water out so meaning we can concentrate the urine because as we take water out, um, we still have the solutes within this part of the nephron loop. And with the ascending limb, um, it's only permeable to solutes. So we can take solutes out. So all that's left is the water that's in this limb. So meaning we can dilute the urine um, in this part of the loop of Henle. So the longer the loop of Henle, again, the better you are at fine-tuning uh, urine formation uh, and urine concentration. So here we see different animals um, and different organisms with different lengths of their loop of Henle. Um, kangaroo rats, which we see here, cute little fella, have longer loops of Henle. Um, basically because they need to hang on to water uh, longer in the desert. They actually have the ability to pee crystals because they, are, they can remove all the water uh, from their urine so they're not losing any water to the environment. Um, so if you compare that to say the beaver, the beaver is in water all the time. So they don't need to hold on to water uh, or concentrate their urine. So notice that they have shorter loops of Henle here. So we say that the length of the loop of Henle is under selective pressure, meaning the longer the loop of Henle, the more concentrated you can make your urine. So animals living in a water environment have shorter loops of Henle. Again, they don't have to hold on to water as much uh, compared to animals living in desert conditions like the kangaroo rat, kangaroo rat who actually does have to hold on to their water in the desert because they don't know, you know, Areas of um, where they can find water are very scarce. The next part of the renal tubule is the distal convoluted tubule. Secretion is actually more predominant in this section of the nephron loop. Uh, so here we can fine tune the ultrafiltrate. Basically, we want to get rid of the stuff we don't need and we put it into the urine um, which will then go into the collecting duct. So the function of the distal convoluted tubule, again, for secretion, um, uh, things that we don't need from the blood will then uh, go into the filtrate um, through the distal convoluted tubule, um, a way of fine-tuning our ultrafiltrate and just getting rid of the stuff that we don't need. We do have 
two different specialized cell types within the distal convolute tubule. We have our intercalated cell types um, help with hydrogen ions to uh, either retain or secrete these ions to help with uh, pH balance or balancing the pH within our blood. And then we have principal cells. Principal cells are important because they are regulated by antidiuretic hormone, which we talked about. Antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, this is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland, um, helps to regulate um, ha helps to regulate us forming co uh, concentrated urine by uh, regulating these aquaporins or water pores. Basically, it opens up the aquaporins to allow uh, reabsorption of water and to concentrate urine. So if you think of the name antidiuretic, it's preventing us from losing water. So we use antidiuretic hormone to retain water and concentrate urine. Okay. Um, so the ultrafiltrate becomes urine um, in the collecting duct. So Urine is finally made and it all goes into this collecting duct. Um, a good phrase to remember is that once you're at the collecting duct, you're in. So we have urine, then drain all distal convoluted tubules will drain into a collecting duct. Collecting ducts will then head towards the apex or the papilla of the renal pyramids where they'll be collected by the different calyces, the minor calyces, and the major calyces, then drain into the renal pelvis, and the renal pelvis will exit the kidney via the renal hilum, and then become the ureter, and urine will then be transported to the urinary bladder, where at the precise moment, um, you will be able to uh, allow uh, urine to exit the body via the urethra, okay? So that is how the uh, functional anatomy uh, of the kidney allows for the formation of urine. And then we'll get into uh, the physiology of filtration, reabsorption, and secretion in the next lecture.